Well, welcome everybody. My name is Tommy Soares. I'm Assistant Director of the, of the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology and Infectious Disease. And today I have a pleasure of welcoming Ryan Peters to be our lecturer for the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Ryan works closely uh, with the other teammates in Dr. Richard Kuhn's lab and he's studying the structure of hepatitis C virus to enable vaccine design. I am so thrilled to have you today to give us this lecture, Ryan. Thank you so much for taking time to uh, give us a little bit of insight into your journey so far and uh, welcome again. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, we're excited to have you. I am certain that there are going to be many, many viewers that are going to be interested not only in how you're studying these viruses that seem a little bit dangerous to study, <laughs> but also like what led you to do what you're doing now. And so uh, if you can take us through your journey, we would love to sit and watch and hopefully we'll have some time for questions afterwards, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. I definitely looking forward to telling you guys about my my journey. Um, so before I get started here, I'm just wondering uh, who we're work who we're talking to today. So I heard you guys are in Toronto. Uh, what grade are you guys in? How's it going? Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I yeah. can. Uh, yeah. So I'm uh, Mr. Rackus. I'm the teacher of the science club here at Crestwood in Toronto. Nice. Um, and the, we have a grade seven student in attendance and some older students, grade 11, grade 12. Is that what grade you guys are in? <laughs> grade 10? Everybody grade 10? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Fantastic. Well, um, definitely looking forward to answering your questions. Uh, so feel free to ask. All right. Let me get started here with the screen sharing. And thank you, Mr. Rackless and, and the group down there for uh, tuning in today. Uh, we, we thank you uh, for always keeping up with our, our uh, program here and uh, participating. It's great to have you. So if there are particular questions that you might want to ask as we go along, you can type them into the chat and then Ryan can, uh, can take them at the end. So Ryan, I'm going to turn myself off. It's all, uh, all to you, my friend. Thank sure you. Sure thing. Fantastic. All right, so uh, so I'm going to be telling you guys today um, a bit about um, what I've been working on, as well as um, a bit about how I got here, kind of my story, um, as um, Tommy was saying before, uh, about my journey. And so um, I know you guys are in high school or uh, middle school, and uh, so especially your high school students, you're going to be uh, thinking about maybe what kind of careers you're looking to go into and definitely about um, potentially college. Uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about what I was thinking at that time. Um, and uh, then we're going to talk a bit about vaccines and viruses as a whole um, and understanding a little bit more about that process. And then uh, my work studying hepatitis C, um, which will um, enable um, vaccine design uh, moving forward. So um, I'm going to get started and st tell you a little bit about uh, my, re uh, my, my journey first. So uh, back when I was in high school, um, I uh, went to a small high school, Southbridge High School. It's a small town in Massachusetts. Um, and I found myself enjoying uh, math and science, um, especially. I remember taking um, AP biology in um, 10th grade, and uh, that really caught my interest. Um, every class has assignments. I'm sure you're uh, doing plenty of those. And usually, um, you know, reading the textbook is not the most fun assignment, but I found I actually enjoyed reading about biology. And so, you know, it really sparked my interest and it was a lot of fun. Um, I really like uh, thinking about how the different components in the cell work together and how they interact. Um, and then, you know, when you think about disease, how those processes are disrupted. So it's very interesting to me. So that definitely caught my attention. Um, and so when I got uh, to anatomy and physiology, 
which was another year or two later, I talked to the teacher and, you know, they let me set up, help them set up some of the labs and, and whatnot. So that was really interesting. I enjoyed that as well. Um, and I found I was also pretty good at math. Um, I'm not going to tell you that I loved doing calculus every day, um, but uh, I, I did like it and it was pretty good at it. So I was thinking as I went into college, uh, maybe some sort of math or science um, area is where I wanted to go. And um, also a little fun fact about me, I also really enjoyed um, doing theater. Um, so that, that's a fun fact as well. So when I got into college, um, I chose a school that is big on science and engineering. Um, and so this was Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Um, I actually entered undecided on my major. Um, that's okay. Uh, most universities allow you to be undecided at first. Um, so I, I wanted to try out uh, different majors and, you know, what that might look like in a career. Um, you only have, at least my experience, I only had so many different classes in um, high school, you know, a physics and a chemistry um, and math, but there's a lot of different types of careers you could go into with that and many different college majors off of each of those. Um, so I tried out different things. I tried out um, electrical engineering. I tried out uh, biomedical engineering um, and I, a few other things. And I ultimately, I found that I really enjoyed um, biology. And so I stuck with the biology uh, and biotechnology major. And uh, working through the classes in that major, I found I really liked the lab-based courses, um, especially ones where uh, we weren't necessarily given uh, an assignment and they, you know, with an expected outcome. I'll tell you a story. For one class, um, they had us go out into uh, the wherever you wanted and pick up a, a, a pile of dirt, you know, a, a test tube, fill it with some dirt. Um, and then we took that back to the lab and tried to grow bacteria from it and see if any of them um, could create antibiotics. And so that was really neat. And I found that to be a lot of fun. Um, and it got me in excited and interested in the class. And um, that's a bit more what research is like. You don't necessarily know the answer, but it's a fun pursuit. And, um, you know, the findings might uh, help uh, create, find a new antibiotic, for example. Um, so I found um, through one of those lab courses, a, a different one, um, that I really, another one that I really enjoyed, uh, I got a, connected with the professor who did research um, similar to that course and did a summer internship in the lab. And that's how I first got started. It was a lot of fun. Um, I went and was uh, working with um, different peers and graduate students that were mentoring me and teaching me all these different lab techniques. And so it was a it was an interesting first summer and I really enjoyed it. And so um, I've been working in labs uh, since then. So um, moving into graduate school, I decided that I wanted to pursue a PhD. So I applied and um, decided to come to Purdue where I am. Oh, oh yes, I forgot about this. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about my undergraduate um, research. So I was telling you I did research in a lab. I can give you a quick snapshot of what that was. So um, I was working on mycobacteria. Um, let me get my pointer here. Uh, mycobacteria cause tuberculosis. And so here's a picture here of the these pesty bacteria. And so we were working on the regulation of RNA. So let me remind you all a little bit about uh, genetic information in cells. So uh, those of you in 10th grade, you've probably heard about some of this in class, um, but we all know that cells have DNA, and this is the genetic material that um, encodes for all the different functions of the cell. And so each gene, when the cell wants to make, um, to make more proteins uh, to do their functions, the gene is going to be activated and uh, transcription will be activated to make an RNA copy of the gene. And then the RNA will go to the ribosome where it will be translated uh, into amino acids, which make up proteins. And so every three base pairs codes for one amino acid. And those amino acids have different properties. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, but when you think about regulating different activities within a cell, a lot of times you think about 
the uh, regulation of the DNA and the ability of the DNA to be transcribed into RNA. Is it open and available or is it closed off and different um, factors involved in that? But there's a whole nother layer of regulation as well, the RNA. Um, RNA can be regulated in different ways. And so that's what our lab was looking at. For example, there's molecular scissors within the cell that can cut up RNA. So one of the um, assays I did often was I took this RNA and I turned it back into DNA through reverse transcription. Um, don't worry about that, but it's just easier to work with DNA in the lab. And then I would run this on an agarose gel. So you can think of it like a jelly. You may have done one of these in your uh, science labs. Um, it's like a jelly and you put an electric field through it and the DNA has a negative charge. So it moves away from the negative charge towards a positive charge. And depending on the size of um, the DNA, it will be separated uh, because larger pieces will have a tougher time moving through that jelly. Um, and so uh, the larger pieces here will be higher uh, than the lower pieces. So these are smaller fragments of nucleic acid. So that tells us something about that sample. These ones, maybe they were cut by those molecular scissors. Uh, and here's a picture of me having fun in the lab. All right, so let's move forward to my graduate um, research. So I'm here at Purdue currently pursuing a PhD. And uh, the first year I was here, I was able to try out several different labs. And so this is a feature uh, that many graduate programs offer, not all, um, where you can try out a couple different labs during your first year. So I tried out four different labs and determine what is the best fit for you in terms of exciting research and the best environment for you to do that in. So I ended up choosing Dr. Richard Kuhn's lab. He's a well-known virologist and we study RNA viruses in our lab. So personally, I'm studying hepatitis C virus, and uh, so are a couple of other people in the lab. So we work together on some of that. And one of my favorite parts about it is that I am working with um, somebody in the lab who's been here for a while. And so he's training me up on a lot of different things. I'm learning a lot from him. And that's one thing I enjoy about science and research is learning from others. And other people are always very willing to help you out with any questions or problems you may have. Um, so that's one thing that I do really enjoy about my um, current lab. So um, with that being said, let's talk a little bit about uh, viruses in general. So we're going to talk a lot about viruses today. So let's give a little bit of uh, background on that. So viruses are very small, uh, but there's a big variation between different viruses. So here this graphic shows um, on the right side, we've got a human red blood cell. You can just see part of it because they're absolutely massive in comparison to bacteria and viruses. So here's uh, an E. coli, which is a common bacteria in your gut. And um, then there's a variety of different viruses we see here. So there are many different sizes and shapes. Um, and I hope you can appreciate that from this diagram. Here's poliovirus, one of the smaller viruses that causes um, poliomyelitis. And, um, but it's a very different shape from say vaccine virus, which is um, related to smallpox or Ebola uh, virus as well. And so during the virus uh, life cycle, so the virus is gonna go through many stages and every virus is a little bit different, but in general, um, the viruses first need to attach to the cells. And so they'll attach with some sort of receptor that's on the surface of the cell. And then they're going to bind and enter the cell. Now, uh, some viruses actually go inside before they release their genome, but some do release their genome on the surface. So once inside, the viral genome, which is either going to be RNA or DNA, needs to make copies. So it's going to make copies of itself, as well as go through that um, transcription and translation process we talked about earlier to make um, proteins. And so these proteins are going to take over the cell and reprogram it to do what the virus wants, which is make more viruses. And from there, new viruses are going to be assembled and they're going to exit the cell. And so the there's a few things that I want to add on to this diagram is that once the viruses are outside the cell, they need to then spread to other cells 
And so that can be a, a important process as well as while they're spreading, they have to evade the immune system. So we have a very complicated and um, efficient immune system. And so the viruses have developed countermeasures and um, it's very interesting and important to understand how the virus uh, interacts with the immune system and is able to escape it in some cases. So we'll be talking a bit about that today as well. Okay, so what are viruses made of? So um, viruses are made of DNA and RNA, like I was saying, they have a genome. And this is in it has the instructions to make all of the proteins that the virus needs. And so the proteins, like I alluded to on the previous slide, are going to perform many functions of the virus throughout the life cycle. Some viruses also contain other components, such as um, lipids, which make up membranes. And I'll talk about that in a slide or two, as well as um, different sugars and other um, pieces that can be attached to it that help it with uh, various parts of the life cycle. So we're going to be talking a lot about proteins today, so I'm going to explain a little bit more about proteins. So proteins are made up of amino acids. Um, as I showed on that slide previously, the RNA codes for amino acids. And so every amino acid, which is pictured by the colored beads here, has a different property. So they're different sizes, they're different shapes, they, some of them like to interact with some of them, but not others. And so because of these different properties, they are going to end up forming different 3D structures. And so they begin to fold into these very complex shapes based on uh, several complicated laws of physics. Physics uh, Physicists could tell you a lot more about these different properties and how and why they interact. Um, but depending on the properties of the amino acids, they will fold into a very complicated shape. And so pictured here is an example. So this is the um, spike protein from SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that has been causing the most recent uh, COVID pandemic. And um, so this is the protein, the spike protein, which is on the surface of the virus. And that is pictured here interacting with the receptor on the surface of your host cell. So this is a uh, blue box here is representing the membrane of your cell. And so this protein is actually sitting in the membrane. And this is um, one of the interactions that the virus uses to attach to your cells. So you can imagine here that if there was a change in one of the amino acids, um, right here, where the uh, spike protein is binding to your receptor, then it might change how it interacts. So if there's a different amino acid there, maybe it has a different shape or a different property. And so now it might bind to your receptor um, better, or maybe a different amino acid would bind um, poorly. So the sequence of a protein is going to dictate what shape it takes, which then um, will impact its function. So um, the, the shape and the properties will give it the function of the protein. So um, I mentioned before that some viruses have lipids and some don't. So there's, uh, you could categorize uh, into two categories, the non-enveloped viruses and the enveloped virus, viruses. So a non-enveloped virus is going to have the genome inside, and then it's going to be surrounded by a protein shell, which we call the capsid. An enveloped virus has the same insides, except it's also surrounded by a double uh, lipid bilayer. So this is a lipid bilayer. It's the same thing that your cells have for the um, plasma membrane. And embedded in that are going to be several envelope proteins. And so, for example, with the um, coronavirus I was just talking about, that's going to be the spike protein. And so here are some examples. Uh, of a couple of viruses. So this is the structure of Zika virus, which was um, actually determined here at Purdue several years ago. And um, this is an enveloped virus uh, and the envelope proteins, there's a lot of them and they kind of are laying down on the surface of this virus. Um, this is adenovirus, which is uh, non-enveloped and you have these large, um, very big um, proteins protruding out here which is very interesting. So the, like that slide showed before, there's a big variety in different types of viruses. And so these are some examples. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about vaccines. 
So you've all um, probably received many vaccines in your life, and there's been a lot of talk about vaccines recently. Um, so I'm going to go through a bit of uh, understanding how vaccines work, why we need vaccines. And in order to understand that, first, we have to talk a little bit about the immune system. So the, your immune system has two major components. You have the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. So when a pathogen enters um, your body, so a pathogen is anything that causes disease, like it may be a bacteria or a virus. Um, and so as soon as your body detects the pathogen, your innate immune system is going to be activated. And so within a matter of hours, your innate immune system is going to kick in and start um, taking countermeasures against the pathogen. And it can attack a broad range of pathogens. And it doesn't necessarily form a memory, as we'll talk about with the adaptive immune system, but um, it just broadly is able to attack uh, pathogens. And so this is what gives you fever, nausea, a headache, exhaustion. So when you feel sick, that is because of your innate immune system. And so that starts to kick in right away. When uh, your adaptive immune system, on the other hand, it takes several days to activate. So um, the first time you're exposed to um, a pathogen, it'll take uh, typically five to seven days for your immune system, the adaptive immune system, to really uh, kick into full swing and start attacking the pathogen. But that's because it's highly specific to each pathogen. So it needs that time to figure out what does this pathogen look like and um, start drumming up um, the different cells and molecules it needs to attack that specific pathogen. And so after it does that, it makes some memory cells. And so these cells are there and always ready to see if they can find that pathogen again. And so you don't have necessarily uh, symptoms as much associated with the adaptive immune system. So if you think about when you get sick, usually you're sick for you know, several days, maybe you start to feel better usually after, you know, five days, maybe a week or so. And so that's your adaptive immune system is kicking in and really um, doing well to take care of that pathogen. So let me show you a little bit more on that timeline. So um, this is for the adaptive immune system. So the adaptive immune system, one way uh, that the adaptive immune system fights pathogens is through the use of antibodies. And so um, this graph is showing that as a representative of how active the innate uh, adaptive immune system is. And so the first time you're exposed to a pathogen, like I said, it's going to take about five to seven days for your adaptive immune system to um, start producing antibodies. And so you'll get a nice response. And then it's going to make a memory so that next time you see that pathogen, maybe a specific virus, then it's going to have a much faster response. Those memory cells are gonna recognize it and kick right into action. They've already figured out how to recognize the pathogen so they can get right to work. And it will be a much stronger response as well. So this is much better because during this time here, this five to seven days, the pathogen has time to amplify within your body and start attacking. And so you can get pretty sick. You're, um, whereas here, your body is much faster to respond and you're not giving that pathogen time to really take hold. And so with the vaccine, we try to emulate this first process. So we'll talk about it in a slide or two, but the idea is we give your immune system part of the pathogen so that it can learn to recognize it. And it will create this memory response such that when you see um, the virus or the bacteria or whatever it may be, uh, you know, if you were to get it from the outside world, then you, your memory cells would activate and you would have a much faster response to it. And so that's why um, we need vaccines and that's how they help our immune system. So they're really teaching our immune system how to respond. So as I mentioned, inside of a vaccine is part of the pathogen. And um, additionally, you also need something to activate the immune system to say, hey, look, this is an issue. And there are several types of vaccines that have been used throughout the years. So 
Um, some vaccines were are made with an inactivated pathogen. So in one way or another, they've made it so that the virus or bacteria can't actually cause disease in your body, but you can give it in a way so that the immune system has a chance to recognize it and make that memory. So for example, um, the polio vaccine that uh, you likely received is an inactivated pathogen. That's the most common one used um, at this time. And so another type is protein. So if you remember, uh, viruses have proteins on the surface and that helps it, that's how it attaches to cells. And so providing that um, protein can, or part of it, can often uh, show the immune system what it would look like. And so there's a lot of vaccines um, that are using this. And so they give part of the um, virus, one of the proteins or part of the protein. The newest um, type of vaccine that you've probably heard a little bit about of um, is a messenger RNA or mRNA. And so this gives that RNA to your cells and they're able to make um, the protein that the virus would make. And so um, you're letting your cells do the hard work of making the protein here. And so the most recent um, Pfizer and Moderna COVID-19 vaccines use this mRNA platform, whereas um, the Johnson & Johnson one, for example, used a protein platform. So there are many other types of vaccines out there, but I just wanted to touch on those three. So how do vaccines work? So you could think of it as uh, like a part of the virus and a big flashing warning side. So we're trying to give your immune system a big signal. Hey, look out, this is an issue. Um, if you ever see this, you know, you should be prepared to um, take action. So it's showing your immune system what the pathogen looks like so it can be prepared in any future encounters. And so you can think of it as if it's big flashing arrow. And so those each of these components have a name. So the part of the pathogen you provide is called the immunogen. And so that's what's going to actually um, be used by your immune system as, uh, I mean, almost a wanted poster, if you will. So uh, the idea is your immune system is going to take this piece, this immunogen, and it's going to practice um, what binding to it. And it's going to see how it looks. And so it's going to remember what this immunogen looks like. So this is part of the pathogen. And then you need your big flashing warning sign. So that's called an adjuvant. So that's a compound that activates the immune system. So there's many different types of adjuvants available. And so this is, um, we really need to wake the immune system up and tell it that there's something going on so that it creates that memory response. It's not going to create that memory response unless um, something is telling it, giving it these warning signs. So we need to give it something to activate the immune system um, and cause it to recognize the immunogen as an issue. Yes. So I'll talk a little bit more about mRNA vaccines. So as I mentioned before, you have um, inside the vaccine are going to be lipid bubbles with uh, mRNA inside, the messenger RNA. And so these lipid bubbles are a, a lipid membrane. And these are going to go and um, fuse with your cell and deliver the mRNA to your cell. And your cell will take this mRNA and make it into the viral protein. So for example, this is the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, which is um, made by your cells after they receive the mRNA vaccine. And so then your immune system is going to start to recognize this and create a memory against this. So anytime it sees this spike protein, then it will activate a big response. So that's the idea behind how the uh, messenger RNA vaccines work. Okay, so I know that was a lot of information in a short period of time. So I'm gonna pause for a minute and uh, take any questions you might have before I talk about my uh, research. Ryan, that was awesome. So cool. Uh, so far. Thank you. Yes. Um, I had a question when you talked about, you know, your first research where you would take a clump of soil and you try to find bacteria, grow bacteria and try to see if they're yeah. producing antibiotics. Can you just explain why would soil bacteria produce antibiotics? 
That's uh, a good why, question. Why? Yeah. Go for yeah. It. So yeah. So in the soil, um, a lot of bacteria naturally live in the soil. That's kind of um, their natural environment for many different types of bacteria. Not all bacteria, of course. Um, and so it's very competitive environment. They're competing for resources, for food, for space. And so it's um, a little bit actually of a competitive thing where they'll try to take out their competitors by creating these antibiotics. And so there's been this uh, kind of warfare between bacteria for thousands and thousands of years, and um, I guess probably millions of years. And so over that evolutionary time, all kinds of antibiotics have been developed. And that's actually where a lot of the antibiotics we use today were discovered from soil bacteria. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting place. People keep going back and trying to find um, new and interesting things. Fascinating. Fascinating. It is. And if, if I can, I have another question. Yes. And the way you explained it, I thought it was awesome. So the immunogen is the wanted sign, right? And yep. so then the adjuvant is like the blasting of the news is like, read all about this and like everybody get your troops ready. If you guys see this, then we know it's trouble and we need to fight, fight, uh, mount an army to fight them back. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly it. Yep. Yep. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. That that's so interesting. I love the way that you put it. I don't want to interrupt you because <laughs> I, if you have more slides, please do go ahead yeah. Yeah, unless there are other questions from Mr. Rathless's class uh, that they would like to ask. And, uh, but uh, none so far on the chat. So that, that tells me that you're, you're clear to move forward if you want. Great. So I have one more thing I wanted to add based on your question actually. So with the mRNA vaccines, um, the, one of the advantages, I'll go back for a moment, is that the um, foreign messenger RNA itself acts as the adjuvant. So your body recognizes when there's mRNA in there that's not its own. And um, so that itself can set the alarm bells going off. And so that's very interesting and it's definitely an advantage of the um, mRNA system as well. So that, that's pretty cool. That is so interesting. So yeah. having free floating mRNA in our bloodstream that is, as you said, encapsulated by these lipid spheres is seen as like a foreign object. So the, are you saying that the, uh, the innate immune system would first have a reaction and, and then the adaptive immune system would then be like, oh my gosh, we got foreign RNA here got to do something about this. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And it, it's also something about the chemical structure. So um, they they give it different modifications to try to modulate that immune response. Um, and additionally, um, sometimes in the purification, there's double-stranded mRNA um, in the vaccine, whereas your body doesn't have um, double-stranded RNA and some viruses do. So your innate immune system Anytime it sees double-stranded RNA, it's always like, oh no, we should, you know, check out this issue. Um, yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. All right. So I will tell you guys a bit more about um, my research. So um, I'm studying hepatitis C, so I'll tell you a bit about that. So hepatitis C has infected 58 million people around the world chronically. And so so chronically in, infected with hepatitis C means for many, many years, um, there's an infection in uh, your liver. So hepatitis C infects the liver. And so this infection is going to go on and on and on. And you may not even realize it. Some people don't really have symptoms or very mild symptoms. And so it can be years before you realize this. And um, 1.5 million new infections uh, are estimated to occur each year. And it's a bloodborne pathogen. So it's spread commonly through um, dirty uh, or reused um, needles for injections uh, and also in poor sanitation. So um, these are uh, issues around the world um, in developed countries with injection drug users and uh, less developed countries with um, poor sanitation. And um, hepatitis C claimed lives of 290,000 patients in 2019. And a lot of this is due to liver damage or liver cancer. 
And so hepatitis C actually is the leading cause of liver cancer. And so it, it's definitely um, not a good um, thing to have for years and years. However, recently there has been some advances, some great scientific advancements have given us effective antiviral drugs. So you're able to actually cure most patients, which is great. Um, however, there's some public health challenges. So the drugs are very expensive. And so that can be a limiting factor for people. Um, people may also not really know that they are infected in the first place. And so that infection can spread. And even if you are cured, you can get reinfected. Um, so it's definitely a big challenge. And because of this, cases are still on the rise in the US, um, last I checked. And so experts argue that we really do need a vaccine in order to combat this disease. And um, it's also always better to prevent disease if you can, rather than treat it. Um, and so there's a big push um, in looking for a vaccine against hepatitis C. So I'll show you a little cartoon of what hepatitis C looks like. So uh, of course we have our genome. In this case, it's RNA, single-stranded RNA. We have our core, which is made of protein, and that's surrounded by lipids, which makes an envelope. So again, that's a uh, lipid bilayer. And embedded in this bilayer, are two proteins, envelope protein one, E1, and envelope protein two. So E1 and E2 um, come together to form this um, dimer, we call it heterodimer. And um, there's some evidence to suggest that it may actually come together in bigger groups, such as this trimer here. Um, but nobody has actually seen this yet, um, but it's very interesting to consider and something that uh, we're hoping to see. So. This is what hepatitis C generally looks like. And so these envelope proteins are on the surface and they're involved in binding to your host cells. So E2 binds to the host cell and um, then they start to enter. And E1 is involved in actually um, fusing with your host cell and uh, allowing the genome to get out and get into your cell and start the infection process. So, uh, in terms of a vaccine, many people have tried uh, to make hepatitis C vaccines. And so the first attempts were using E1 and E2, right? Those proteins on the surface, that's what the immune system is going to see. Um, people have tried to use that as a protein-based vaccine. Uh, but unfortunately, it hasn't worked very well. It hasn't been able to create a good, robust uh, response. And that's because a uh, multitude of reasons, but hepatitis C is very good at evading the immune system and hiding. That's how it can um, have an infection for many years, um, as well as having a high mutation rate. And so there's some places in the virus that mutate really fast. And so, for example, highly variable region one, which is abbreviated as HVR1. So it kind of acts like a mask, a Halloween mask. So the problem is, uh, and it sits kind of, we believe, on top of E2. I'll show you in a moment. Um, but we believe it kind of acts uh, like a Halloween mask, you could think of it. So let's say you give a vaccine and it's got E1 and E2, and the one you're giving has a highly variable region one mask that's the Dracula mask, for example. So let's say your immune system recognizes this Dracula mask, it makes a good memory response to it, but then when you get infected, it, maybe it's actually uh, one of the other ones and your immune system might not recognize the cat or the pumpkin. And um, even throughout the course of an infection within a single patient, it can change from one to the other because this region um, changes really quickly. And so your immune system can have a hard time keeping track of all of these. So um, what people are trying to do is modify E1 and E2 to give the immune system a better picture. So there's some parts of the virus uh, E2 and E1 that don't change as much. And um, so it would be good if we could get your immune system a picture of those parts. So here again is that cartoon of E2 and um, highly variable region one is this blue squiggle on top. So you can see how it might sit on top kind of like a mask, masking the parts underneath that are very important. So if we were to kind of look at this from the top, I'll show you what that protein structure looks like. So you may not be familiar looking at these and it might look like a, a squiggle of ribbons. Um, and so this is a, a representation of the protein structure. 
structure. So the amino acids are in here uh, along these lines and ribbons. And so this is again looking down on top of it, kind of how the immune system would. And so the dotted line, highly variable region one, you see is dotted because we don't actually know what shape it takes, what the structure is, what does it look like, where exactly is it lying and covering. Um, so we, you know, it's a little bit of an unknown. And so, but there are some other parts of the virus that can't change. So for example, this here, CD81 binding loop. So CD81 is one of your host cell receptors that the virus is going to bind to. So it really needs to bind to that receptor. So it can't really change this part of the E2 protein very much, or it won't be able to bind to the receptor and get into your cells. So if, for example, we could train the immune system to recognize a part like this that doesn't change, then maybe it would have, it would have a better shot of recognizing the virus when it's coming in um, because it won't be changing as much. So the idea is we want to show the immune system these sorts of parts, but it's challenging to do that when we don't know what it looks like in the first place. We don't know what highly variable region one looks like. We don't necessarily know what it looks like when uh, a bunch of E1s and E2s come together. And so it can be challenging to design um, a better immunogen. So that's where my project comes in. So I'm studying E1 and E2 to try to understand what they look like. And what's the shape? What's the 3D sh structure? And so it's very challenging to study hepatitis C virus itself. It's very hard to purify and uh, get enough to study and uh, enough of a, a similar sample. So I'm first focusing on E1 and E2. So what I've done is put them on the surface of a different virus particle uh, that's a bit easier to study. So you could think of it this way. So we're using a lentivirus in this case. Um, the system is based on lentivirus. And so we have a lentivirus. Uh, we add all the components except for the lentivirus envelope protein. And we add the hepatitis C envelope proteins. And so we get these particles, which look like hepatitis C on the outside because they've got E1 and E2 but on the inside, they're not necessarily. And so they're made in a different way. And so uh, they're a bit easier to study. And so we call these hepatitis C uh, pseudoparticles or HCV um, pseudoparticles. So uh, let me tell you a bit about how I make these pseudoparticles. So um, first I add several pieces of DNA to a human cell. And so the first one, this piece of DNA has all of the genes for the lentivirus, except for the envelope. And then I add another piece of DNA, which has the hepatitis C envelope proteins. And then this piece of DNA just helps the other two um, be produced. And so then this cell is going to make the hepatitis C um, pseudoparticles. And from there, I can do a couple of things with the pseudoparticles. So first, I'm going to take them, and I want to make sure that they're working properly and that I've got the right um, pseudoparticles. So I can add them to another cell uh, type. So these are liver cells, which is what um, hepatitis C normally infects. And um, if they're working properly, they should be able to bind and enter because that's what E1 and E2 do. And then they'll express um, this tag. And I can measure whether they get in and make this protein because it glows. So it works actually the same way as a firefly does, the same way a firefly glows. Uh, these cells will glow if the virus is able to get in. So um, that way I can tell that I've got uh, working um, uh, pseudoparticles, which is very cool. From there, um, I'll purify the particles and um, I'll start doing structural studies with the microscope. So the purification process is pretty complicated. I'm not going to take you through all that stuff. Um, but I will show you kind of um, one of the steps, the last step, which is very interesting. So uh, we do, uh, for that, we use a uh, centrifuge. We use a very big um, centrifuge. It spins very, very fast, like thousands and thousands of rotations per second. Um, it's really, really fast. And so that applies a very big force of gravity. And uh, that is going to be used to separate uh, different components from each other. So we add in a test tube. So this here is a test tube that has a gradient. So it has um, layers of a solution that has different density. 
And so um, when this test tube is put into the centrifuge and spun, uh, what you put at the top at the beginning is going to separate based on their density, right? And so uh, I'm sure you remember density is based on uh, mass and volume. So based on those um, parameters, they're going to go to different spots uh, that have a similar density, if you will. Um, and so that's, you know, called sedimentation rate, but don't worry about that. And so you can see that there's a few spots where it seems like we've collected um, stuff during this purification. So to analyze each of these layers of density, we're going to do what's called a Western blot. So I can walk you through this briefly. Um, so we have our layer from the gradient, which has a bunch of proteins in it. And so the first thing we're going to do is do uh, run another gel. So similar to the gel I told you about at the very beginning, this is similar, except now we're doing it with protein. So again, we're going to use an electrical field to separate it as it moves through uh, the, the gel, which is like jello again. Um, and so the bigger proteins are going to stay near the top and the smaller ones are going to go towards the bottom. And so they'll be separated by size. From here, we're going to transfer it to a different type of uh, membrane. It's kind of like a fancy um, piece of paper. And um, that then we're going to add some antibodies that um, are able to glow. And so this is each antibody recognizes one specific protein. So part of a very specific protein. So then we can see just exactly the protein that we want to. So. I'll keep this here for reference as I show you the Western blot. So here is one of the Western blots. So um, again, they're separated by size. So the larger proteins are going to stay towards the top and the smaller ones go to the bottom. And here are the sizes. And so for this one, I've got um, all the layers from my gradient. And so um, you can see that I've got some good signal over here. And so the green is from an antibody that glows green that detects hepatitis C E2. And the red is from an antibody that detects um, the capsid protein from the lentivirus. So here you can see in layers three, four, and five, we have good um, signal from both the lentivirus and the hepatitis C. So these look great. And if you remember previously, in numbers three, four, and five, we saw um, these white glowing bands, which indicates there's um, lots of sample in there. So it looks like these ones are the ones we want. So that's um, part of how we do the purification. So from there, then we're going to take this and look at it under the microscope. So as I mentioned before, um, viruses are really, really tiny. So we can't use a regular um, light microscope. Um, although it is somewhat similar. So the first thing we do is we take our sample and we're going to put it onto these really tiny grids. So this grid is smaller than a pea, um, but it can hold tens of thousands of viruses, um, lots and lots of virus particles. And so we put our sample on there and we're going to um, flash freeze it um, in, uh, we use liquid ethane, um, but it's going to make it really, really cold. And so it's going to be down at cryogenic temperatures. And the reason we do that is because when you start looking at things that are really small, if you think about um, maybe your chemistry class, you may have talked about it, or biology as well. When you're really small, all these molecules are moving. Everything is vibrating a little bit just because of heat and motion and you know diffusion and things are moving around. So in order to get a clear picture of what we're looking at, we put it at really cold temperatures. So it freezes. So everything is stable. So we can take a look at it. Um, so we, we do everything at super cold temperatures. And then we're going to use the uh, electron microscope. So it's similar to a microscope you've probably used in class that you look through and you use light to see it. This time, instead, we're using uh, electrons. And um, so these are really big machines. And so they take up an entire room. You know, you've probably heard your parents being like, oh, you know, computers used to take up a whole room. Well, these microscopes take up a whole room. <laughs> so um, this, is, this one is, you know, 10 feet tall approximately. And, uh, you know, it takes a whole room to have all the different apparatus uh, components it needs. So you put these tiny little grids in there and into the very big microscope and take a look at your viruses.
So here is um, one example image from the microscope. And so you can see here, uh, I've pointed out some of the particles. So those look like our virus. So it's very exciting. Um, so it's very interesting. So if we take thousands and thousands and thousands of these pictures, then a computer algorithm can then figure out what the 3D shape is. And so it's very neat. So this is one of the um, more recent pictures I've taken. So this is what it looks like through an electron microscope. So once we have a better picture of what E1 and E2 look like, then we'll have a better idea how the immune system sees the virus. And we call that the immunogenic surface. So how does the immune system see the virus? And then that will give us clues on how the virus is escaping the immune system so that perhaps we can uh, create a way to show the immune system the parts of the virus uh, that don't change, the important parts of the protein that it can target better than what it is um, normally trying to target. And so we're trying to do that. And that way, the immune system is going to recognize the virus upon infection. And the goal is to prevent you from getting sick in the first place. And so hopefully we can help um, a lot of people out and protect a lot of people against this virus. And so that's um, you know, what motivates me in science and one of the reasons I chose to get into biology is that in the research we do, you know, this, the part that I'm doing here, this small part figuring out the shape is going to go into a bigger effort to help make a vaccine and it's going to help people um, eventually. And so that's one of the motivations behind it. And I definitely enjoy that aspect of it. So with that, I just want to give a few acknowledgements and thank people um, that have helped me out along the way. So my undergraduate advisor, Dr. Scarlett Shell, um, and my graduate advisor, Dr. Richard Kuhn, as well as all the members of the lab who have been very helpful in teaching me things and um, supporting me. And a special thanks to um, Dr. Shashir, uh, who has been help so helpful in everything and training me up, um, as well as some of our collaborators who have given us some of the uh, different reagents we need and my um, funding sources as well. So with that, I'd be happy to uh, have a chat, talk about whatever questions you guys might have. But thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. There is a question that says, could you speak a little about precautions that may be taken in the lab to ensure that the virus is, does not spread? That's a fantastic question. Um, we take a lot of precautions. Um, as you can probably imagine, you definitely don't want to be infected with these viruses. Um, so there's many different precautions, and it depends um, exactly what you're doing. Different activities are a bit higher risk than others. Um, so we're always wearing um, personal protective equipment. So that's going to be things like gloves and a lab coat and goggles. Um, and sometimes we're also wearing um, a, a face mask, like uh, N95. Um, but some of the biggest uh, uh, safety guards we have uh, is the uh, equipment that we use to work with it. So whenever we're working with the virus, we're always inside, um, we call it a, a biosafety cabinet. So it's similar to the fume hood that you probably have in your um, science classrooms, um, except uh, this one is designed specifically to keep um, what's inside inside. So it keeps all of the virus and stuff in there. And so it, it's always contained. And so there's a piece of glass between you and the virus. Um, and it's sucking air in to and putting it back and uh, sucking the air in and filtering it before it's released. And so there's a lot of controls in that sense, um, in terms of the actual uh, tools we use. Whenever you take yeah. it outside of that hood, it has to be in, you know, multiple levels of containment. Yep. Yeah. And I, I guess, you know, Ryan, the, the procedures that you take to mm -hmm. work with this material is not willy nilly that, oh, this is, I'm just going to go do this is, yeah. you know, I think people need to understand that there is a mess, a method, a process that you take yes. and that that process every time, not only when you work with something has an 
intake process, but an outtake process to ensure that you're not spreading any viruses afterwards and how to dispose exactly. of all of the PPE and equipment that might have touched the virus. And yep. it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, I, it I is. Mean, the, the, the amount of, and I know, I know there are different levels of biosafety mm -hmm. that are taken to deal with different uh, viruses of different danger uh, yeah. levels, right? And so some that might be considered biosafety level two, uh, you use certain procedures versus a biosafety level three requires a very specialized laboratory with very specialized procedures in there to be able to work with those types. And it goes up to biosafety level four, right? I mean, yeah. it would be uh facilities that are just working on like anthrax and like uh yeah very dangerous yep. viruses right yeah um, yeah and that, there's lots there's lots of planning that goes into it and there's lots of people to help with that um before you you can start any work at all you know you have to have plans for like you said how are you going to get in there what are you going to do with the stuff afterwards and disposal so there's lots of plans and procedures um but there's lots of people to help you with that um in the lab and at the institution as well yeah, and exactly. I mean, this is why you're you're being trained, right? right? Exactly. Yep. And, and you know how fascinating the the vaccine um, approach that we are that are using and that you're taking down down this line, which is a structure based design approach. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, and. And has it always been done like that? Well, how did we how did we design vaccines, or how did we make vaccines prior uh, to to knowing how to design them this way? Yeah, yeah. So for um, a lot of things, you know, people just started out with trying stuff. Um, so uh, for some viruses or pathogens, you can provide part of it. And um, it, the immune system's able to recognize it and make a good response. And yeah. then there's some that for many years, people just couldn't uh, figure out how to do that. Hepatitis C is one example. Um, and now we're starting to get um, the structural tools to be able to design it. And so another example is um, the uh, HIV. So for years, people have tried to make an HIV vaccine, um, but it's been very difficult. And now with the structure information about it, there's actually some in clinical trials, um, which is very exciting. Um, awesome. And so the idea of being able to design it from a structure standpoint is definitely something that is new. It's up and coming um, and it's enabled by our ability to study more structures. And um, so it allows more um, precise design uh as opposed to um you know trying stuff and seeing what works i i love the way you also describe the electron microscope <laughs> and what we're doing there you know i hope that in mr rackless's class you guys heard that because i want you to imagine you guys taking a magnifying glass and walking a football field and looking at the blades of grass and which orientation each blade of grass is pointing to recording each one of those and then computing afterwards how each one of those blades of grass and what orientations are possible in every single one of those uh, um, feet that you stepped onto that that grid uh, in in the microscope. And I mean, I I want you guys to really imagine that that's what the microscope is doing at a very 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 tiny tiny scale. And the grid that you showed, can you go back to that slide? Yeah, sure. And Maybe we can show we can show the students this grid is like the grid that you would have in your faucet under your faucet uh, uh, that runs the water, mm. spreads the water so that it it splits it up, right? Like it's like yeah. one of those grids, <laughs> but it's it's the it's yeah. the molecules that get stuck 
in between the the grid faces, right? That you start yeah. seeing. And so go to the next slide. Are we seeing one of those grid bars in your micrograph here? Is that that straight line there? Is that one of those grid bars that you would think? You, yeah, roughly, that? roughly. This one is, um, yeah, it, this, so this is the carbon, which is what this particular grid is made out of. Whereas okay. this here is the ice, which contains our sample. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So neat. So yeah. neat. And each one of them being viruses, look how different they are in size. Look yeah. how different they are in even sometimes shape. And, yep. yep. Oh my gosh. It, it's so awesome, this technology. Ryan, Definitely. thank you so much for talking to us today about of course. this. Um, Thank you I, for having uh, me. I hope I hope uh, others are as as enthusiastic about their work uh, as you are, and we wish you much success in continuing to do this work and saving us uh, with something that could uh, uh, <laughs> create a hepatitis C vaccine. So, thank you very much. Yes. And, uh, um, yeah. Go ahead, party You're words welcome. if you like. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a blast. I hope you guys learned some things and uh, feel free to let me know if you have any more questions. We did. Well, thank you again. Thank you. you. Have a good so day. Bye-bye.